the cloud. And um, yeah, I think we're good. Okay, great. Um, so I guess we're ready to begin. Uh, I have only one announcement and it was kind of prompted by uh, Francis who asked me about, should we be talking about what's going on with zoning in town? And the answer is yes, but not tonight. <laughs> uh, there are a variety of things going on. It doesn't, I don't know how far along to say they are. Um, one has to do with the infamous footnote M which would affect uh, the amount of additional building that could be done as infill on Lincoln Avenue and a number of other locations wow. in town. Uh, anyway, I don't know whether the planning board's going to move on that quickly. It's basically a mess and somebody needs to come up with a good idea to get us out of the mess. I won't describe it any further. The other two things that I believe are going to be on the planning board agenda are um, ADUs, which are accessory dwelling units. That could mean a something added on to a house that would be a, essentially a standalone, or not a standalone, but an additional dwelling unit, which could be a studio, it could be a one bedroom, could be any of a number of things, as long as it's within reasonable size, which I think is a thousand square feet roughly, or it could be uh, something else on the pro on, on, that's physically separate on the property of similar size. So the planning board is taking those up. And the other thing that I believe is going to come before the planning board are changes to the inclusionary zoning provisions. But to be honest, I'm not sure of any of it and if it looks like something's going to happen within the next month, then we'll definitely uh, make it a part of our next meeting and uh, give everybody enough notice to prepare for some discussion. Yeah, so, I'm making a follow up with that quickly. The you know planning staff developed a few. There's that yeah, John mentioned most of them. There's the mixed use building standard. Um, that proposal too, and maybe an overlay in the limited business district. And those were presented to the CRC, the community resource committee, the planning board seen them as well. And um, I think the CRC kind of has to prioritize what they want to you know, move forward at this time. There was a mention of the inclusionary zoning bylaw and um, maybe the accessory dwelling unit and possibly another one that isn't, hasn't been worked on too much is a new definition of an apartment building. But I do think that the, uh, the inclusionary zoning one would try to capture most projects that, may, that produce 10 or more units. So it would take away the requirement for special permits. So it essentially, you know, the idea is that any development except for a residential subdivision or a fraternity or like a residence hall would have to provide affordable units if they created 10 or more new units. And so the council at the CRC meeting, you know, it's a members of town council, it's a subcommittee of the town council. They, they were interested in, you know, pushing that one forward. So it's pretty simple. Um, I can send you the draft language. You know, it's really just taking out language in the existing bylaw and making it apply to a broader set of projects. But you know, I'm sure there's gonna be a little bit more discussion of it, but that, that one seems like, and the accessory dwelling unit are ones that seem pretty ready that you know, they could, they could um, it's now the CRC. You know, the idea is that the CRC and the planning board would discuss it and then they would, um, and then it would go to town council as a formal zoning amendment. And then town council would essentially refer it back. But the CRC is, you know, thing that those two, the accessory dwelling and inclusionary zoning might be ready uh, to go to council as a formal zoning amendment soon. So I think if we hold off any significant discussion of this till mm -hmm. our next meeting, it will still be timely. Would you agree with that, Nate? Oh, yeah, yeah. I mean, what I'm saying is ready to go. I mean, my thought is a vote might not happen for like three months, you know, but um, that's pretty quick. It's consistent <laughs> what I think I told you, Francis. <laughs> okay. Uh, any other announcements? Okay. Welcome, Erica. I see that you've joined us. 
Sorry, my camera doesn't work. Oh, okay. It happens to me sometimes too, actually. And what happens with me is if you uh, if you use WebEx and then Zoom, Zoom yeah. gets cut off. I don't know why. Yeah, yeah. And then I have to restart my computer. That's right. That happens. It hasn't worked for me. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Um, okay, our first agenda item is reviewing the minutes from January and February. If you may recall, I sent the January minutes with less than 24 hours to review at our last meeting. Uh, and then I sent the February minutes about a week or so ago. So uh, we are theoretically ready to discuss either or both of those. We should probably take them one at a time. Our, Ray, uh, looks like uh, Nate's got the February minutes up on the screen. Are there any comments on that or concerns that anyone has? There were just some typos, but I don't think it's a big deal. Okay. Typos, Ooh, John. What'd you say? <laughs> I'm just teasing. Erica, feel free to send those to me. I can fix them. Okay, I will do that. Okay, so we, can we switch back to the January minutes? Um, I don't know if I have those ready to show. I'd have to um, see. I don't know if I have them open right now. Um, let's see. I might be able to send them to you. Uh, that's always tricky for me, but. Yeah, I'll just stop sharing for now. I don't know. Does anyone ha have any other comments on the February ones, though, or are they we're all set? Sorry, John, I actually, when you said the January minutes on your email, I think it was the February ones that you had attached. No, I attached the February minutes a week ago, but. At our last meeting, right. oh, which right, was in right, February, right. I right. had sent the January minutes just before the meeting, which yeah. um, so theoretically everybody has them and has been pouring over them. Um, For sure. <laughs> okay, we'll, we'll get them to you again and maybe take it up next time with the uh, March minutes. Okay, the next item of business I had was the um, update on the urge emergency rental assistance program. Again, I sent out late this afternoon uh, two tables from uh, Jana Tetra of uh, Community Action Pioneer Valley. Uh, I'm gonna tell you, I honestly didn't see anything startling or unusual about those. Uh, it looks like they are continuing to roll, enroll people at a steady but slow pace, which is what we've seen since certainly uh, since December, although it really wasn't that quick before that. Uh, anyway, from what we see, it looks like uh, what they're, well, Janice is counting the number of applications a little differently than she did before. She's basically eliminating those that were immediately ineligible. For example, ones that um, people from communities other than Amherst applied from. So the, it looks like the total number of applications are down, but that's not strictly speaking true. It's just she's she was saying, well, I was over counting before because we had these applications that were obviously ineligible. So now she's only including the ones that had a chance of being eligible. Obviously still, we're not saying all of them get approved. Uh, so at this point, it looks like, let's see, um, we've got, uh, I don't remember, something like uh, 42 applications total that have been approved. And the proportion approved is, I, I can't remember, I can't see it. Could you pull the thing down a little bit, Nate, so I could see the percentage approved? Oh yeah, I can't see what you guys see, so I'm. Oh, okay. 
Well, actually, it looks like it's a little over 20% that get that have been approved in both rounds. Yeah, not that much. I'm not sorry. that much, but there's a total of 42. My guess is if applications continue to go in at the rate that they have, we'll end up with somewhere between 50 and 60 applications approved, maybe say 55 if you want to put a specific number on it. Um, also, again, if you look at the money that has been spent so far, you're looking at just under $80,000. Again, my guess would be the total by the time June rolls around is going to be about $40,000 higher or $120,000. Uh, a lot of the, or most of the money has already been covered not by our commitment, but by money that came from the federal government through DHCD as part of the CARES Act. And we may actually get additional money uh, under the newest uh, federal legislation, which the president just signed literally this afternoon. So as of now, of our $250,000 commitment of money that we had in the trust. I, I have no idea how much we are gonna spend, but it could be well under $100,000. It could be zero, depending on whether the town gets new money from the latest legislation. So I guess all of that is good news for us. Um, and it's nice that we've been able to already serve 42 families, hopefully that number does go up to between 50 and 60. So I think we can certainly say that it's been a modestly successful program. I'm glad we did it, but I think our expectations originally were that uh, the numbers served and the amount of money we we're gonna spend would be considerably higher. So that's the story. Are there any questions or comments? Yeah, I got, I got a question. In looking at the incomplete applications, which, you know, it was high on the first one and then it went a little lower. Um, are we able to quant quantify what, what incomplete means? And did we do any follow up with those incomplete applications? Um, in, you know, just to try to figure out if there was anything more we could do with those incomplete applications. Yeah. I don't have all the details in front of me, okay. Sid, but one of the things I do know that mm -hmm. Jana and her staff did try to follow up with people okay. who didn't complete their applications. They followed up at least once for every person, uh, once by email, once by telephone, and once by US mail. Okay. So essentially they made at least three follow-up attempts. Uh, and usually with this kind of stuff, I think you may get a little bit more with more than three follow-ups, but there's definitely diminishing returns beyond that. Most of my experience is with mail surveys and there's, uh, there's some literature that suggests people should go out to three call, uh, six callbacks, mm -hmm. um, but three is pretty good and it should capture uh, the people who are eventually going to complete for the most part. You know, there may be a few that you'll lose, but I don't think it's that many. Sure. Do, you think we could, do you think we could ask John, um, you know, ask Community Action to reach back out? Because it is a high percentage. I mean, it's like 38%. And then there's, yeah. but it's the number who have withdrawn, which is different than incomplete. And so I mean, I, I will say I, I'm I, I'm probably one of those incomplete applications just because um, I went in to test it, <laughs> mm, and then to right. test it, you know, once you once you enter at one field um, and you save it or it automatically saves, you, then you're considered an incomplete application. So, um, but yeah, I mean, it is a high percentage. So I, I, it, I is. it is. I, I mean, I, I yeah, I feel like we could ask ask your John to look into it because I mean, it could be that. You know, sometimes she said people, you know, they thought they were ineligible, so they just don't finish it, right? They thought their income, you know, their income was too high, or I don't know, for whatever reason, they didn't think they needed it. So I'm, I mean. Well, in previous reports, 
Janice given us more of the chapter and verse of right. what specifically was incomplete. You know, for example, for whatever reason, people are not able to get together pay stubs or other financial information that is required for the application to be reviewed. Uh, so uh, another significant reason is uh, missing information. I can look at uh, prior notes from Jana because I tend to save everything that comes into me for better or worse and send a note out said to everybody about what the sources of incompleteness of these applications are. Yeah, that'll be great to see, you know, if it's quantifiable. Yep. Yeah. yeah, and I can also ask Jana to come to the next meeting and we can have more discussion of it. But uh, as I said, I think she has already given us some information and I'll pull that back out and share it again with everybody. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? John, as I remember it, I think we made changes based on what they were seeing as barriers. Um, so hopefully things get easier. Yeah, I mean, we did make some changes. There are now circumstances where people could self-declare the loss of income so they wouldn't have to show paperwork. Um, we've also made it possible for people to get a, uh, a second award so that if they continue to have problems paying rent, they could apply for an additional three month period uh, on top of the three months that were, they were already granted. So you're right, Erica, we did make some changes. Those are the two that I remember right off the top of my head that were intended to make it a bit easier. Any other comments or questions? I mean, one thing I think, you know, you know, we did extend community actions contract through June, but I'm not sure how much we can extend it beyond that or if they'd be willing. So I think as a trust, maybe, you know, when this program ends, we could, if there is money left over, we could discuss, you know, what, if, would we want to do another type of rental assistance program or what do we do with the funding? I mean, it can, you know, it goes back to the trust. We don't have to spend it necessarily on a rental program, rental assistance program, but, um, you know, we had talked about doing something like a local voucher program or something. So, you know, I think this is a good, this is a, you know, if anything, good experience. And we could talk to community action and see what they think. I mean, I, I'm still wondering if some of the eviction piece and just the backup in the courts, if, you know, if like, what if next summer it actually gets busier? I mean, I, yeah. don't, I don't know. I mean, we, we thought it was going to happen now, but it isn't. And, uh, you know, but, you know, when, when units start turning over again, you know, June through September, is that going to be a busy time where landlords just, you know, don't renew leases because they just, you know. Um... Yeah, well, we can go to uh, the housing, the clerk of the housing court of Western Massachusetts and see what he thinks because he follows eviction data. And we could also ask uh, for the opinion of people at Community Legal Aid. Uh, I think it's Jen Berenger there, I can't remember, yeah. who's head of the Northampton office who I've talked to. So we could follow up with either or both of those sources. Um, there haven't been many evictions in Amherst. Uh, there's a statewide group that has a chapter in Springfield and I'm not remembering the name. I do remember the person who represents that group on Pamela Schwartz's meetings has given me numbers about evictions in Amherst and they've been pretty low. These are evictions that have been filed or notices to quit and they've generally been literally less than 10. So I don't know, Nate. <laughs> yeah, no, I don't know. I mean. Yeah, I think in the CARES funding um, reimbursed quite a bit, as you said, so. So we have money to burn. Well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, anything else or should we go on to the next item? I'm okay, I'm okay going on. Okay, uh, the next item is the work that we've been doing on the draft request for proposals. 
Uh, the working group met again two weeks ago on Thursday. It'll meet again on Thursday night, March 25th. We've made quite a bit of prog progress. At this point, we've pretty much completed review and discussion of all of the evaluation criteria. Um, we'll probably end up making a few more changes, but right now, mostly Rita, a little bit of contributions from me and eventually Nate are occurring so that by the next meeting of that group, um, we'll have uh, what you will see in a minute, which are the evaluation criteria that have been developed so far. But then on top of that, the parts that go earlier in the RFP that describe both what the housing trust and the town's goals and objectives are for this procurement, and also what it is we specifically expect that the uh, developers who are bidding will give us in the way of information as part of their proposals. So uh, we're pretty far along really, as I said, uh, well, I don't think this is exactly done. I think we'll probably continue to tinker a little bit with it. Um, it's substantially completed. And those other two sections are intended to set this up. So most of the thinking about what we're doing and why we're doing it has now occurred in that group. So I don't know, Rita, do you want to take us um, through some of the key things that? Yeah, well, there are, th maybe they're up on the screen. I don't want to just uh, sit here and. Yeah, no, Nate, read, put them up but, on the screen. Yeah. Um, you know, what I'd say just to add to what the your presentation, John, is that um, we we really have been working backwards, which I was John's suggestion and I think was really was was a good one. It's not the way I typically have approached an RFP, but we've developed these the criteria and then what will happen is um, this will get incorporated into the narrative of the RFP. So as you see, this is an appendix appendix to the, the actual request for proposals itself, but it lays out how the trust will look at the proposals that they receive. So it's the, you know, the priorities around affordability, unit and bedroom configuration that kind of goes into design, you know, a bunch of other things. And, and it's been great to have the, um, the working group. Um, so that is Erica, Francis, and Carol. Um, John and I and John Page too um, have been kind of going through this and talking about all these, you know, the the different criteria. And I think we've we've gotten to a good place. It needs to be um, refined and looked at, you know, back, you know, as I'm starting now to write the actual RFP itself and um, integrating all of this, and then just. Uh, at the very, just before this meeting was starting, Nate and John and I were talking about having a um, meeting with, with town staff just to kind of preview where we're going with the RFP to see if there's any other concerns on the, on the town's part um, about where the, where the trust is, is going. So I don't know if you wanna scroll down, you know, the affordability, we did the unit and bedroom configuration. We're talking about one to three bedrooms, but with an emphasis on larger bedroom sizes. Um, I think we're allowing for, um, you know, affordability, but some potential for having uh, above 60% of area median income. So having a little bit more of a, an income mix, if that works. Uh, with on the Belchertown Road site, we can go up to 100% of area median income and potentially could have some market units. But I think it was, you know, there was interest certainly on the part of, of the working group to have some mixed income. Obviously the emphasis is on getting the affordable units, but if we can get some other units in there too, that would be um, advantageous or highly advantageous. So if you want to keep scrolling down. Wait, I, I just have one comment on the first line that yep. also uh, affects other things that we've done. If you look at the difference between advantageous and highly advantageous, it doesn't look like there's much of a difference. 
but advantageous basically lays out what the minimum criteria are. We struggled with this a bit and said, okay, well, how many units would we say they should do for highly advantageous at 60%? And then what should the percentage be at 30%? And we ended up deciding not to put in specific numbers under highly advantageous, but in essence to challenge the developers to see how much better they could do um, under highly advantageous than we expect them to do other advantageous. So if they can figure out how to finance uh, more than 40 units, and if they can figure out how to finance more than 13% of the units at 30% AMI, then we'd be really pleased. But we decided not to put in specific targets, but to just say, do what you can to do better. And I guess the only other thing I would add, because the 13% of the units affordable at 30% AMI seems like such an odd figure, but that is taken directly from the state's Qualified Action Plan, which is the um, Department of Housing Community Development's guidance for um, getting financing through um, the Low Income Housing Tax Credit Program and their other programs. So that's those are their requirements, and we just incorporated those into um, into our proposal, our criteria here. And we're we're expecting the forty units too across. Uh, both sites. So we're that's correct. As if it's so yeah, so this is, um, yeah, we're what we're doing in the RFP is we're the property as I've been talking about it is a is the East Street and Belchertown Road sites combined. You could keep scrolling down, I think, unless there are other other questions. Yeah, we'll be saying, going. We're going to go back over this, John. Right when the whole RFP is done. It yes, will be, we will next uh, two weeks from today. Okay, for the working group, but then it's going to come back to the trust. Yes, too. it'll come back to the full trust. Okay, all right. Um, so I think we did the unit and bedroom configuration. You can. Yeah, and that's going to be the same. Highly advantageous is can you do better and right. give us more two and three bedroom units? Right than what's under advantageous. Um, so again, we're looking at the developer track record um, and the difference uh, between the advantageous and, and highly advantageous is um, the amount of experience, and then we added uh, demonstrated experience dealing with publicly owned land. Questions about any of these criteria? You wanna keep going? No, uh, would we require that they submit references for yes. this, right? So we would have them submit. Yes, some, yes, like we project. do look for references, yeah. I don't know why the, the, uh, some of the charts. Oh. Yeah, I think that just the formatting gets a little, yeah, <laughs> funky. The amount of number of times it's been edited. Um, so financial feasibility is, uh, you know, we are looking to understand whether or not the, the developer who's submitting a proposal has a, um, is coming up with a development that is uh, viable, financially feasible, meaning um, can they, for what they are proposing to build, can they secure the financing um, to do it? So you look at what's called their development budget, which um, is composed of all the sources that they are, the financing sources, and then the uses, which is how they're going to spend the money. And there are um, kind of standards. So, you know, for these, these developments and your sources have to equal your uses. Um, and you have to demonstrate also that you, um, you know, have an operating budget and 
So, you know, this is all pretty uh, prescribed. Um, the things, you know, we're looking at a, a sources and uses, we'll be evaluating is there, you know, where they're saying they're gonna get money from and looking at whether or not that's realistic and whether or not their operating budget kind of falls in line with um, the standards for um, development. So it looks like we're going to um, ask for a rent schedule by bedroom size. Yes. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So they, you know, they provide a whole a, a breakdown of rents by unit size, and we verify that it, you know, falls within the guidelines that we've already set forth. And then um, understanding, you know, is what they're proposing uh, reasonable and financeable. I'm sure the, trust, the town's going to be mentioned in there as a possible source. <laughs> <laughs> Go for more CPA money. Yeah, well, <laughs> um, um, there's actually a section in the RFP narrative about that that we have to revisit because we did say with the East, when we, when we put an RFP out, which we did for those of you who were not on the trust at the time, a couple of years ago, we did a request for proposals um, or as a standalone with the E Street School. And um, one of the things that we did say in that RFP was that we there was an expectation that the developers would come back and potentially seek um, CPA money because at that point, the only CPA money, the only trust money that we put into the E Street School before that RFP was to do the um, the due diligence to look at the, you know, get some design work done, do some initial wetlands uh, evaluation. Now we're in a very different position um, because we used a significant amount of money for the acquisition of, of the, a significant amount of CPA funds for the acquisition of um, Belchertown Road. So I think, um, you know, this is a very, it, it's, different now that we're putting something out that's much more much more significant, can be quite a few more units um, than E Street was as a standalone. So we really need to think about under what conditions might the town want to consider any additional CPA funds or when the developer puts their financing together, are they going to be looking for more money from the trust and or from the Community Preservation um, Committee. So the projected schedule is just the developer telling us um, how long it's going to be. Um, and uh, I'm just looking at this again. The trust yeah, I mean, time table. advantageous is uh, six months is pretty. <laughs> Yeah, I don't know why that doesn't seem right to me. Um, I think it's too quick. Oh, it's a timetable. It's just a zoning application. Yeah. So um, I was thinking it was a financing application. Um, so basically what's going to happen is um, we'll go through the RFP. The RFP um, gets, gets issued. And I think John has, you know, we have kind of a, a tentative schedule. Um, worked out, but the once we get proposals back in from developers, they, those will get reviewed by a committee, and a um, developer will be awarded, um, designated for this development. And then what happens after that is that the town will negotiate what's called an LDA or land development agreement with the um, with the developer. And um, what that does in effect is it will give the developer kind of standing um, to go before the Zoning Board of Appeals. So, um, which we assume they're gonna need to get uh, probably a 40B in order to do the um, kind of density and the type of housing that, um, that we expect. Um, so it's a land disposition agreement, and then that actually leads into a into a lease, um, 
the lease too. So what we're trying to do here is make sure that once we've designated a developer that the process keeps moving and that it doesn't languish that we have a developer who's been designated but then decides, well, I have a lot of other things on my plate and this is not a high priority and I'll put Amherst on the back, um, on the back burner. So we're trying to keep them to a pretty ambitious schedule and um, that's, what, uh, that's what this projected schedule is, is attempting to do. If people have questions about any of us, please stop us and ask. Because, I mean, I've been through this once before, so I have some sense of what's going on, but not everybody may share that experience. So if you have <laughs> questions, don't be uh, reluctant to ask them. John, you have someone in the audience, but I think one thing just for the trust too, the, I think the town plans to lease the properties and not, you know, not That's correct. Uh, sell them. So, you know, the, the properties would be, would be leased to the developer. So you have a question from the audience? Some, somebody from Valley. Valley has their hand raised. Sure. Sure, Valley, you can uh, unmute yourself. <laughs> Hi, it's Laura. So just a quick comment about the timeline. Um, if you assume that comp permits are needed for the sites, um, it does, there is a preceding step of going to get a, a project eligibility letter from a state agency, which as a developer, you don't have a lot of control over how long that takes and can easily, I've had it to take up to nine months to get one of those letters. So <laughs> just an FYI um, mm -hmm. that can't go direct into the zoning um, process. I've never, I haven't heard that, Laura. That's pretty um, sobering to say it gets nine months to get a project eligibility uh, letter. From MHP actually was the one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that isn't good. <laughs> no, it was awful. Yeah. <laughs> I think, yeah, I mean, I think, yeah, it was interesting. I guess, Laura, to your point, I was wondering when um, when I was reading this, right, what do we consider um, the zoning application? Is it the beginning? So is it the project eligibility or is it the actual 40B application? Right. Because um, sometimes we consider that all one mm -hmm. process because, yeah. yeah, I mean, even a, a quick um, a quick project eligibility is probably like two or three months. Oh, and a minimum. Right. 30 days to comment. You know, there's a few, like yep. a week or two ahead of that. Then a few weeks, you know, it could be a month after that for yeah. you know, the site visit. I mean, so. Uh, right. And we found, uh, obviously, at the Northampton Road project, we were um, encouraged to keep delaying the submission of the PEL um, mm -hmm. so that there could be more community input. <laughs> and so <laughs> it did become a, a much more extended process. Than okay, we so we'll, we'll take take a look at that. It, again, you know, it's trying to achieve this balance of not, um, of allowing enough time, but not so much time that yep. Um, yep. I mean, people don't call, see yeah, some, guess, some urgency to. Um, sure. I guess if we define the zone, I mean, if we just had a definition for zoning application, right? If we define mm -hmm. that somewhere. Um, yeah. Okay, I wanna keep keep moving through there. There are typos in here that I'm seeing as I'm reading this. So like rationale. We'll catch the <laughs> catch those yeah, before yeah, the, yeah. the right, so final so RFP we'll goes out. Um, um, yeah. So the development design, we actually had a lot of um, discussion about with the, with the working group. Um, some of the language here is language that's taken um, directly from the qualified action plan. Um, some is um, language that we discussed, um, such as the building massing um, that you know, we, we had, the, the group certainly had interest in not one, one monolithic building so that there was some uh, kind of design thoughtfulness thought going into the um, you know the the appearance of the uh, of the buildings on both of the both of the sites, and then a lot of discussion about the East Street School, 
and whether or not the East Street School is um, retained or not. And I know from the town's perspective, there's real interest in seeing um, the East Street School incorporated into the new um, development and discussion about, you know, what else, what other sources of financing the town might provide if the East Street School is um, retained. If it's not retained, then we talked about how um, any new building could incorporate elements of um, the original East Street School into the into the design. Yeah, and so that I know. Go ahead, John. Um, just the look and feel of the new building. Maybe some elements of the East Street School are mimicked in the design. It could include uh, taking away, for example, or saving doors or windows from the school and reusing them. I mean, there are beautiful wood doors that were part of the original entrance of the school. Maybe somebody could figure out a way to make use of those. There are these large classroom buildings. This may be impractical, but essentially we want to encourage developers if they don't think there's a way to reuse the school to basically honor the history of the school and its former presence on this land. Questions? No, I do think that the, um, yeah, the design standards will, uh, I like that, you know, the monolithic, uh, you know, that description, you know, if, if anyone's seen the newspaper, the new proposed mixed use building in downtown Amherst has not been met with um, appreciation. So I think the 132 Northampton Road has a nice, um, you know, a nice, nice plan. And so, you know, there are examples of how it can work. So, you know, I think, yeah, I mean, my thought is if we want to have any other kind of qualifications other than monolithic, then, you know, we could might want to just consider those. Like, what else are we looking for in a design if people have any interest? You know, I mean, I think um, that's all. Just, you know, I mean, the Amherst character, maybe, I mean, I mean kind of says it, but. Um, it was surprisingly challenging to come up with <laughs> words. <laughs> so if anybody has any other ideas, please. So, yeah. so you'll Tell know us. it when you see it, Francis. Yes, <laughs> that's right. It's, yeah, and it is, it is um, it, when we get too prescriptive, then um, it can become a problem. Yeah, yeah, I will say the, um, Right, the mixed use building standards uh, zoning amendment that was proposed, the planning board discussed it the other week and one of the members said, well, it looks like you can still build ugly mm -hmm. with those standards. And it's like, well, yeah, I mean, they only have some basic things about how to break up a facade with architectural relief. It's not describing materials or size of windows. And so materials and yeah, I agree. I think it is hard unless you want to just come out and say, this is what I want it to look like. And you don't give any um, you know, interpretation of it. So, but yeah, no, I, I, I haven't, I, you know, I, I don't have any ideas right now. I do like that. I like the way it's described. I was just wondering if, if people have any other comments about that, this would be your chance to, you know, put it in there as part of the review criteria. Well, this is not the last time we're going to be seeing this. So <laughs> <laughs> it will be going through a couple more reviews. Um, so we, uh, previously on the East Street School, we actually had incorporated uh, or combined um, design with sustainability and um, we decided to um, break that out just to kind of highlight it because it is something that is um, highlighted in the qualified action plan too. Um, so this is around elements green, climate resilient, conservation of energy resources. And then also, you know, we have, um, both sites have wetlands. And so um, that's gonna, that is gonna impact what, you know, how the, the site can be designed. 
just want to make sure that's done in a thoughtful way. Questions? Let's keep going. <laughs> um, so, uh, Laura, I would be interested, Laura from, from Valley, or if there's any other developers here, I see Jim Linfield here too. Um, we, you know, we have gone through this discussion about um, management and the management plan. And um, I think there's a lot of, you know, been a lot of discussion about things uh, around eviction procedures and you know some some details that um, you typically wouldn't have in an RFP. Um, so I guess my my question from the on the from the development community is um, we are have put in here a preliminary plan for the ongoing management and maintenance of the development. So not requiring a, um, a final management and maintenance plan. Um, and I just wanted to get um, a reaction to that, if you're willing to offer it. I see an eager beaver. <laughs> <laughs> I think both Valley. Yeah. Uh, Laura, you're, mm -hmm. that's Laura again. And Rachel. Yeah, I would, one of my comments is that when you go through the 40B process with the zoning board, they'll also require a very specific management plan. Mm -hmm. And so I would just be aware of that. Um, I would be concerned about this uh, provision for 60 day notice. It's very specific and Honestly, if you have a problem tenant who's endangering other tenants, this becomes a safety issue for the building. So I, I just, you know, it seems a little too prescriptive um, and might not just be what everybody wants in every situation. What but I would def definitely be looking for something preliminary at this stage because DHCD is gonna go through the management plan. The zoning board's gonna go through the management plan. Personally, I'm more interested in what kind of services are being brought to tenants um, to, to support them um, rather than just notifications, um, longer notice that they're gonna be evicted and things like that. We have another hand raised. Yeah, it's Rachel. Nate. Hi, this is Rachel Belanger from Wayfinders. Um, just wanted to echo that I, I really appreciate the um, attention to this topic and emphasis on on good property management. Um, I do think it's it's a bit early to delve into some of these details, not knowing exactly which uh, funding sources will be used and which types of um, rental assistance. Um, it's it seems it feels premature to lock in some of the details. Um, but I think that said, I would, as a developer, I'd be um, perfectly happy to respond to a, a criteria um, explaining that the trust would have the you know, rights to pursue, to review these documents at a, at a later stage, um, you know, for, for X, Y, and Z to ensure um, that they're meeting certain goals and just kind of, um, go through that process when the, the time is right for the project and, and when the other um, parties at DHCD and, um, and others are, are also focused on these documents at the same time. It can be a, a more productive discussion when everyone's looking at them at once. What if we limited the 60 day notice to circumstances in which uh, someone was unable to pay rent as opposed to behavioral problems? Would that feel more comfortable? Um, for me personally, I think um, another approach to get good responses could be to, to ask the respondents to explain their, their eviction policies and um, history of, of using eviction. Um, sometimes 
the practice can be more um, progressive, if you will, th than the policy that's in writing. And so just kind of um, maybe asking for a narrative to, to find out how they've approached it in practice in the past uh, might, might provide enough information. I mean, one, one thought I had here is, you know, we're asking for a management plan for this specific uh, project, but we could ask for a sample or, you know, one or two, right, of recent or, or what they think are good management plans from their projects. I just, you know, not that it's, I mean, it's just, it, I mean, because we're asking for, I mean, really it's for this project and maybe it is too uh, early to have something that's so detailed for I mean, yeah, well, can, can I think what we don't want to do is say, what is the management plan for this project? No, <laughs> that is premature and in and will be um, developed over time. But so I think by putting in a preliminary plan or an outline or mm -hmm. kind of the, you know, the guiding principles or, you know, something like that, that we want to know kind of how, how do you approach management and maintenance, but that you're not absolutely locked in. And, and I think, you know, we could, I would suggest to the working group that we um, revisit some of the, the language and some suggestions made here tonight might be, um, we might find a way to um, kind of be a little bit less prescriptive, but achieve the same, our same goals. Mm -hmm. That was another raised hand. Um, yeah, Jim Winfield. Uh, yeah, I, I would agree with the same is that it put it, you know, you could put it in, this is our intention. These are the things mm -hmm. we're examining. I mean, by there you, they'll, you know, whoever is applying will know, hey, we're gonna look at your management plan. We're gonna look at how you treat evictions. Doesn't lock anyone into someone and you find the best, again, I think what Rachel said, you find, someone may be more progressive in their approach as opposed to limiting. I also know for me and Rachel, we're not willing to make any commitments without a review by our management team and our, you know, the Wayfinders management team. We're, we're just the project managers. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. Okay. I keep, keep going. All right, hold on, I just saw. Let's see. Um, so community support, I think this is really similar to what we used um, when uh, with the E Street proposal. Um, basically, just what we want uh, the developer to um, demonstrate that they've actually um, done community process before, how did they address um, community concerns, and um, how did they how did they work through it? And I think, at least for the developers who are uh, represented in the audience here tonight, um, they've had this experience. So they'll be able to tell us there how they've done it. And then fair housing and equal opportunity. Um, this is pretty um, standard. Um, language and a lot of it comes again out of the qualified action plan. So it's the very things that um, the developers are going to have to be answering for in their applications for financing. I do want to say under highly advantageous, we hope to challenge prospective bidders to go a little beyond what the requirements are for DHCD under the qualified app action plan. Um, we don't want to have people just sort of go round up the usual suspects, so to speak, in doing outreach. Um, we hope that more can be done in that vein to assure that uh, communities of color uh, are well represented in the pools that end up being the basis for selecting who gets into these developments.
Any questions from the trust? I think that's it, Nate. Fantastic. Yeah. Yeah, as we both said, we think we've made great progress on this and this pretty well defines the sections that um, have yet to be presented, the major sections outlining goals and objectives and what specifically we're asking developers to include with their proposals. You know, this looks good. I mean, I think that, um, you know, that's a lot actually as part of the review. I mean, there's, although six categories, there's a lot within each to look at, so. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's really thorough. And the, yeah, the working group has done mm -hmm. a phenomenal job. Yeah, and then I guess for the uh, rest of it is just, yeah, I mean, I think, you know, I thought that we could set up a web page, put documents on there, you know, surveys, plans, reports, um, you know, the GIS data is available for download. We can link to it if anyone needs that. So, what you know, we can just try to make it easy to get information on the properties. Yeah, that's all in the in the narrative. And I think we did that with East Street where there was um, a link to um, right. to the, you know, having a, there, there's a folder with all of the information yeah. so the about working, the properties. The working group will see that in two weeks or actually a bit before, and you all will see that in roughly a month. See yeah. the, what we hope is the, uh, penultimate draft, or not that final draft. Uh, let's see, there are a couple other things that came up. The main one was that uh, we need some authorization from the housing trust for some additional expenditures. The couple of things that have come up, one has to do with people who are already living on the property. As you may recall, there are two houses. One's unoccupied, but the other one apparently includes four undergraduates who are expected to graduate in May. If for any reason they wanted to say, stay and we're gonna want them out to make the property free and clear to developers, then we would have to take some actions to work with them to assist them to move. Um, and that includes hiring a consultant to manage that process to be sure all the I's are dotted and the T's are crossed and uh, potentially to pay for some costs related to their moving out. Now, again, if they're undergraduates, they're graduating and they're just moving out of state somewhere or moving to Boston or whatever, then I don't believe we have any obligation to do that. But if for some reason they're going to go on to graduate school, they want to stay in the community, and their preference would have been to stay in this housing, then we may need to provide them with financial assistance and our consultant will help to determine that. So we need authorization to pay our consultant and potentially to pay expenses uh, uh, related to moving if we're obligated to do that. We may not be. Um, things are looking pretty good when we learn that, uh, as I said, all of the occupants of the house are people graduating in May. And Nate, you had a couple of other potential. One is um, ongoing property maintenance. So, oh, right. you know, the, the, we can't use CPA funds to, for that, um, evidently. And, uh, but the trust has some non CPA funds that could help with that. So even just like, you know, like trash and recycling while the tenants are there for the next few months and, you know, that type of thing. So I, I don't, I'm not sure, you know, we just had, for instance, a snowplow bill for the storm the other week. And I mean, you know, those kind of minor things, but, you know, those kind of carrying costs are not typical. You know, I think when the trust voted, it was more for like affordable housing pieces, not maybe something like property maintenance or relocation. So I just wanted to have, you know, a vote on that. And I think, you know, John, I mean, we could say up to 20,000 for these pieces and, you know, or some amount. And then that, you know, that authorizes the trust and John to approve invoices or, you know, any expenditures for that. So right now we have, you know, 
I wouldn't feel comfortable building the trust for some of these expenses just because I, I can't say the vote was clear enough earlier. Yeah, I think 20,000 is a good upper limit. I can't imagine it'll be more than 10 unless something really unexpected happens. So I guess I can move that uh, we uh, authorize the use of additional trust funds for up to $20,000 for expenses related to property management, for expenses relating to potential relocation of tenants, and uh, I guess anything else that we haven't anticipated that might come along. Are people comfortable with that? I have a question. Sorry, Erica, yes? Yes, so the assumption is, is that they have extended leases and that's why we're responsible for them? No, their leases run out in May, um, but there is a Uniform Relocation Act, both a federal and a state statute that obligates us in to provide alternative housing or to um, assist them with moving expenses or whatever, if they would otherwise be in, be wanting to stay in that housing. Even with an expired lease? Yes. I, Rita can second guess yeah. me or <laughs> say oh, anything yes. further, yeah. but I believe no, the answer a, is yes. Yeah. yeah, no, as a municipality or part of, you know, public government, we're, as the owner now, we're responsible, even though the leases were set to expire. Um, so. Yeah, I mean, that would be true. Uh, for example, if a private developer takes over a building where there are people living and intends to knock the building down and build something new on the property, those obligations, I believe, would be there under these statutes. So you can Google the Uniform Relocation Act <laughs> to get further information, but having heard some discussion of it, I don't consider myself an expert probably have enough information to be dangerous. But my understanding is that that is what we, we're required to do. I just, I, I wanna add um, that the town's gonna continue to collect rent on uh, the house at 80 Belcher Town Road, correct? But those funds go back into the um, CPA yeah, fund, is that? They do, yeah. So that, you know, there's the town will receive funds, but we can't put them into the trust or recycle them right. just for this property. So they go back into the general CPA, um, you know, pot of money, which is a, you know, we originally we were thinking that the the rental amounts would just cover all of these costs that we could just, you know, recycle it into the the carrying costs for the property. But we were told that that can't happen. So I don't want to say that happened late in the process, but. You know, I think that when we found out we were already assuming we, you know, we weren't told otherwise. I guess I, I guess we just hadn't asked the question clearly enough. I don't know. It was one of those things that was kind of wasn't considered. Okay, was there a second to my motion? A second. Will? Okay, so we should do a roll call quickly. Uh, Will, you're in favor, I guess. Uh, Allegra? Yes. Erica? Yes. Francis? Yes. And Sid? Yes. And I'm a yes. So the motion passes, I believe that's six to zero. So that's a comfortable margin. <laughs> Thank you all. Okay, so I think we're ready to go on to the next um, uh, discussion of business. And that is our strategic action plan. At this point, we have a, an amended a strategic action plan. There are some new things that are in it that weren't there before. Um, I will say without asking anybody's permission, uh, I initiated something that relates to one of those areas, which is the one that had, had to do with uh, finding new potential sources of revenue or financing for affordable housing. Uh, coincidentally, literally, I think it was a week or two weeks ago, uh, the Mass Housing Partnership came out with a request for applications for people seeking technical assistance 
um, either for an existing housing trust or for a housing trust that wants to come into existence. And I sent in an application, which I copied or I included as an attachment on one of my notes for all of you to ask for technical, technical assistance on improving our ability to finance affordable housing. Uh, actually, I may hear about that tomorrow. It went to Shelley Goering, who I know at MHP, um, who has been responsible there for trying to, for the care and feeding of housing trusts around the state, as well as developing new ones. So with any luck, uh, we may get approved for some technical assistance around improving financing. One of the things that I did say in the application is that I thought we would have a small subcommittee that would work with Shelley and whatever additional consultants we might get through this process uh, to work on this issue. So uh, I, because the application was due last Friday, I did not have a mechanism to seek everybody's input. I guess I asked for Erica's input because I know she was the author of this provision. <laughs> she seemed to be cool with it. Uh, so uh, hopefully everybody's okay with that as well. Okay, so I, in my note to you all, I focused on the things that were newest. And so I thought we should talk a little bit about those and try to identify uh, what we might already be doing uh, and what we wanted to do further and really how to set some priorities and organize ourselves post RFP <laughs> to begin to address that. So Nate put up the five-year goals, which I appreciate. Um, and if we go down a little bit, we'll see what uh, the completed initiatives have been. Uh, and we've obviously done pretty well in securing some town property, the East Street School property. And uh, we got the town support for the purchase of the Belchertown Road property. And now we're putting those two together, which is great. Um, we've done those other things. So now we're up to priorities for uh, 2020 through 2022. Uh, 2020 is over, I think. <laughs> so we're talking about the next two years and possibly beyond as things that we uh, want to work on according to our strategic action plan. And the one that I mentioned already is shown as number nine, explore new and existing revenue sources, including institutional sources, et cetera. John, I think we, um, on number eight, we were going to take COVID out of there. I thought we had done oh, that right. to, to say kind of any, any pandemic or I don't know, national emergency. I don't, we had some other language in there. Um. Yeah. And actually I did something with respect to number seven uh, or the housing coalition did that. Uh, and I was gonna mention it a little bit later but I'll just note it now. And that is the housing coalition is setting up three uh, really 90 minute meetings the first one will occur on March 30th. And I'm highlighting that right now because it's a meeting that will focus on uh, creating a path to home ownership in Amherst for low income households. The primary presenters of that meeting will be Valley Community Development, which does have a home ownership program that's been funded by the Community Preservation Act Committee, the um, Amherst Community Land Trust, and uh, Pioneer Valley uh, Habitat for Humanity. So they're the groups that have been involved already in doing home ownership projects in, in Amherst. And so they're gonna be the major contributors or participants 
to this meeting on the 30th. We're also inviting other people to participate, but mostly we also hope that there'll be an audience that has ideas about this uh, or concerns or things they'd like to see happen. Uh, and that will be on March 30th. So uh, hopefully we come out of that with some goals for how to expand the existing home ownership assistance programs basically how to do better than we've done in the past. They're small programs. Um, you know, they probably amount to uh, less than, or maybe about 10 new home ownerships. I'm oh, sorry, more than 10. 10, 10 in about every three years. Uh, because Pioneer Valley will do a couple and then they're waiting to do another one potentially in Amherst, but they don't have anything on the books right now. Amherst Community Land Trust has money to do two home ownership uh, properties now and they're trying to get those started. And I believe Valley has still four from their last Community Preservation Act allocation that they're working on. So, uh, you know, and, and, and those will take at least two or three years to uh, come to fruition. Yeah, I okay. think this is an interesting topic when we, again, going back when we presented some of this, uh, the zoning to the planning board and CRC, the community resource committee, a lot of the members asked, well, can we get more home ownership? And I said, well, you know, the town, we can't, we can't, the town's not a developer, and so we can't make a developer do home ownership projects. But it is interesting that people are asking about it. So they're saying, "Oh, it'd be great to get you know more cottage style development, you know, or townhouses that are ownership or you know somehow like condominiumized or something." But um, I don't. I mean, I, I I agree it's a good idea, but it's interesting. I don't. I think they they feel like the town or the trust should be able to just could could do that. And I think it's more complicated. I think the financing is really <laughs> really difficult there so um yeah that's why the numbers have been so small nate yeah and yeah i think it's a good i think it's a good topic i i just you know yeah if the town had more money and could subsidize home ownership then i think that would be a possibility but you know we're, it's just interesting that that's you know when valley did their strategic visioning a few years ago a lot of people said they'd love to see you know 12 to 20 unit developments with more home ownership but it's like there's just not the funding isn't there um, my only yeah, thought I mean, John is my only thought with well, number 12 the ongoing one uh, actively advocate for um, initiatives that address homelessness and support homelessness prevention I think that might you know I know the Craig's doors I think is really looking for a permanent location and I think that you know the town council has voted that that become a priority so I know it's under ongoing but it may be something that the trust uh, either gets pulled into or may, you know, want to, you know, just stay abreast of like, I don't know where that conversation is, but I think the thought was that by next shelter season, there might be some more, you know, or, you know, the ball gets rolling on that, you know, that it's not just a, you know, every shelter season, figure out what's happening, but come up with a better plan for the shelter or, you know, things like that. So they were able to get by this year. Um, but, you know, I don't know what it looks like for next year. So any other comments or expressions of interest on these initiatives? John, I just have one comment on number seven. Um, I'm, I'm wondering if we want to add production in there because housing assistance only sounds like it's like rental assistance where you're, but we're actually promoting rental production and perhaps you know, should be thinking forward to, is there a way to promote home ownership production too? Yeah, fine with me. I mean, I've been thinking that if we can get uh, approval to use the Strong Street property, that that could be potentially a place where we could do home ownership production. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, maybe we can put some condominiums up on that property or uh, small houses or something else 
because uh, it's not on a main bus route, but it is something, you know, that might be uh, reasonable for uh, people from 60 to say 100% area median income. So could we just add housing assistance and production programs? Fine with me. Does anybody have any objection to that? And Francis, since you're here, <laughs> um, and you're other, wearing your other hat, you know, it would be um, wonderful. I, you know, I know people have been talking to Mass Housing about how to um, promote home ownership as a way of equity building for um, people of color. And it is the greatest wealth wealth building opportunity. So um, I assume that there's some discussion, at least I've heard there is some discussion both with mass, mass housing and with some other of the, um, of the quasi public housing agencies about how to, how to put home ownership back out front yeah, we actually, thank you. I was actually going to make a comment, but yeah, Mass Housing, um, after we we did, you know, a lot of lobbying and stakeholder engagement and data gathering for about two years, and the governor gave us $60 million to create homeownership opportunities in order to narrow the racial homeownership gap. Uh, so right now we're primarily working with Gateway Cities and the city of Boston uh, to create homeownership units that will have a shorter deed restriction on them um, because it's you know if it's uh if the deed restrictions are in perpetuity you're not really building wealth um over time and intergenerationally um so i did want to mention and i'm sorry i need to read over the whole action plan but i think it would be um, important to think about how we are both supporting and advocating for narrowing the racial home ownership gap um, yeah. And I think that should expand to communities of opportunity, like Amherst. Um, that was in the had. housing bill, right? So I think it was specific. Yeah. It's at Gateway Cities. It was pretty. So it's no. So it was its own. The money we got what it was its own thing. It was from the sale of um, I think GE uh, was going to develop something and then it didn't. Um, so that's how we received the money. But we want to, yeah, and it's the first time in a long time that any quasi or state has been involved in home ownership. Mm -hmm. um, so it's, but I think that we wanted to start primarily with places where households of color are buying and live and have communities. Um, but yes, I mean, I think as the trust, we should think about not just rental, but how are we supporting down payment assistance? Um, closing cost assistance and anything else that can um, help support home ownership. Yeah, I mean, hey. you know, the land trust, Amherst Community Land Trust, work, you know, had C, has CPA money and they're, you know, supporting two home ownership units, but on a per unit basis, it's like 150,000 a unit. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, with, with Valley, we've been able to do it. Um, I don't know, maybe it's like 70,000 a unit is what it get, you know, if you factor in, I don't know, you know, with admin and other costs, but you know, it is, it is, it is uh, pretty expensive. And um, yeah, I mean, we've done it for about 50, 55,000 is the lowest we're doing it right now for as a, you know, um, assistance for down payment or something, but it does get a little tricky. It's definitely not cheap, especially with housing costs that continue to increase because there just isn't enough supply. Right. But um, yeah, I think that it's one of those things that we have to keep advocating because if, if nobody's talking about it, then nobody's doing it in a way, right? Um. Yeah, John, that can go hand in hand with your exploring new ex and existing revenue sources. Mm -hmm. right? Yeah, I guess, I mean, yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's interesting though, it's like the conservation world for con you know conserving land. It's like, you know, homeowners like just, Property owners, I mean, the town has like probably like a queue of them who are willing to donate land. But when it comes to housing, it's just, I don't know, for whatever reason that isn't there, you know, it just isn't, hasn't reached that same, um, same kind of level or profile. So, you know, and it could happen. It's just interesting that it doesn't. So, I mean, I'm, I'm always surprised that, 
hearing like, oh, this homeowner is willing to donate their land to the town for conservation. It's like, they don't even, it's like, it's like, they just don't even think, you know, they don't even blink. Like, okay, yeah, we'll just donate our land. Yeah, but, well, we should look and see whether a, a piece of that land, if it's on a public way, can be uh, basically separated from the larger property. Right. Which would I go into conservation and, and, and be used for housing. I mean, that's a perfect- Most of the properties are, are, you know, outlying residential areas, but- Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I do think we had talked about the homelessness piece. I'll just go back to that. I mean, I just don't want to lose it. You know, I do, like I said, I think it was in, um, you know, it is in the trust bylaw too. Yeah. As, you know, one of the areas of, um, responsibility so yeah i had sent actually you dave and kevin and jerry all a note about a piece of property on fearing street that janet mcgowan alerted me to that i thought might potentially be a location for uh a uh for craig stores and nobody responded to me <laughs> <laughs> But I agree, Nate, we, we should continue to look for things we can do to support Craig's stores and uh, uh, going beyond shelter. Mm -hmm. But then we're doing that when we try to develop the kinds of new housing that we're working on for Belchertown Road and East Street. Right. And we'll say for the zoning piece, you know, they're, um, you know, they're, with the mixed use buildings downtown, you know, they, none of them provided affordable units because they didn't trigger inclusionary zoning. And, um, you know, there's some rumblings that, you know, more products are going to be, you know, in the next year will be, pro you know, proposed downtown. And so if we want, you know, affordable units in those to, you know, um, get the inclusionary zoning bylaw amended would be important because, you know, otherwise they're not, they're, there's no mechanism to have them provide affordable units. So the, uh, you know, I think the zoning piece, you know, even I know Rob Crown and I said we we're going to work on it. We've talked about it, but we haven't put pen to paper. I mean, there's a number of things the town is also talking about, just, you know, redefining certain uh, housing uses and how they're permitted. But I do think inclusionary zoning is something if the trust, you know, if you, I'll send you the link to the, all the documents, but if we think that that is a high priority, we could write a memo encouraging the planning board and everyone to, you know, and the council to uh, make that, you know, something that they review first, as opposed to waiting. Um, you know, I do feel like it's somewhat of a missed opportunity if we have four new buildings proposed downtown and we get, you know, hundreds of new units and we don't have any affordable. Um, and my understanding is if the planning board is considering those bylaws uh, and that happens before the new proposals come in, then the new proposals would be bound by those bylaws, assuming they eventually are passed by town council. I don't uh, know if I got that quite right, but. You know, the legal ad for the public hearing for the zoning amendment, if that's published, uh, I mean, it's a little nuanced, but if, essentially if, if, if council and the planning board think the zoning amendment's ready to go to like a public hearing to be reviewed, to be adopted, and that public notice is, is uh, made before a permit is in hand, a land use permit, then the development would be subject to the, um, that provision. So. so there is some reason to want to move quickly on changing right. the inclusionary zoning bylaw. Right. So Nate, um, just remind me, because I um, wasn't working with the town when this happened, but you know, there was a, wasn't it Judy Barrett who did a lot of, um, right. examination of the inclusionary zoning and made recommendations. So she was an outside zoning expert, made recommendations, right. whatever, you know, are those still relevant? Are they, I, I think for the trust, which doesn't have any yeah. real zoning expertise, um, right. including me, I'm not, that's not my, um, it's not my forte, uh, you know, you can say we encourage you to do inclusionary zoning, but the exact, you know, language that needs to be changed is. Yeah, no, I, 
so I, I yeah I mean so I worked on the new inclusionary zoning draft bylaw and I think it's great <laughs> no um so Judy Barrett you know was a consultant for RKG and the town hired her in 2014 and she uh researched what other other communities had done and there was a proposal at the 2016 15 16 annual town meeting um you know I have copies of all this and it wasn't it wasn't adopted I think a lot of people felt that she was giving too much to a developer. So there's, you know, density bonuses or things like, oh, if they provide affordable units, they can get another floor or things like that. And it just, it didn't go over well. But then two years later, the town did adopt, um, kind of recycled some of her material and, you know, um, adopted some more um, updated the inclusionary zoning bylaw. So it does now allow for, you know, um, offsite units if, you know, certain things are met and also um, has a payment in lieu of too. So I think that the language in the inclusionary zoning bylaw is pretty good. You know, it has a percentage calculation for a number of affordable units. Um, it has these two provisions for not providing the units um, in the development. And, you know, it used to have all these waivers. Like if you did this, you didn't have to provide them or if it wasn't a special permit use. So I think now it's really just saying any development that that creates 10 or more new units. Um, Judy Barrett's was a little more complicated. I don't think it needs to be more complicated. You know, um, Cambridge and others have like square footage requirements and percentages. And this is just, you know, if you make 10 more units, you have 10 to 14 units, you have to provide one affordable. Mm -hmm. 15 to 20 is two affordable. Greater than 21 units, net new units is 12% have to be affordable. And um, you know, and that's, you know, that's, that's pretty much it. So, so are you suggesting that the trust do a, do a letter to, well, I can send you um, the link to the materials and we can talk about it at another future meeting, but okay. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I, I don't, you know, there's been some discussion about lowering it to less than 10, like, you know, but most communities don't, you know, I mean, at some point there is a cost burden to the developer so if we're saying you know like at six units you have to provide one that's a pretty to me that's a, a you know some people may want that but that to me that's a really low threshold i think 10 units is fine you know i you know so someone develops eight new units they don't have to provide affordable units i mean you know it's really capturing anything with 10 or more units so i mean the trust can talk about it too it's just yeah i think i said that we take up these issues yeah. um at our next meeting yeah, so I we think can we talk have... about specific things that we want to advocate for yeah. among the zoning amendments that are being considered. I'll send, I, I, I'll send you a link to everything, the new zoning amendments. And if you have staff, if the trust has questions, you can ask me and um, yeah, I mean, you know, Cambridge has a pretty, and Brookline has some pretty, you know, more complicated inclusionary zoning bylaws. Um, and I don't, I don't, I feel like it doesn't have to be, you know, but and then maybe we'll get pushback from someone saying we're asking too much, too many affordable units. Undoubtedly, we're going to see that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, okay. So we've had this list up in front of us of things that um, we could and should be doing. Um, so 12, we talked a little bit about 13 is really what we've just been discussing town policy and zoning. Um, is there anybody who wants to jump in on any of these others to say, yeah, we really should be doing X, Y, or Z? And I'm quite I willing just, to. Sorry, Erica. That wasn't me. It was Francis. Oh, was, oh Allegra. Sorry. Oh, it was Allegra. Allegra. I'll go after Allegra. Okay. Um, I was just going to say, in terms of number 12, I'm thinking about initiatives to address the unhoused population. In addition to shelter, I think it would be worthwhile to think about, is there the possibility of creating short-term subsidies instead of putting a person in shelter to have a more housing-based solution? Approach. Housed. So that's, that's what I wanted to add. Yep. I mean, if we can imagine the program and think about how to finance it, there's no question that we could propose it. Um, if it's housing, uh, unlike shelter, then it could come out of Community Preservation Act funding, I believe. Yeah, I mean, Amherst Community Connections is doing that now. The CPA is given you know, money for subsidy for people to enter into 
but really it's kind of like transitional housing, but um, you know, that's through one organization. It's not something that the trust has designed or, you know, worked with, but yeah, I think CPA would, would you know, can fund that. What and I was going think... to oh, sorry. sorry no, go ahead, Erica. No, I was just going to say that, you know, looking at all of this, I mean, it's hard not to want to be involved in it all because I think it's all interlocked um, and interlinked uh, in terms of trying to create a good foundation from homelessness all the way to stability in housing. Um, but it's, it's hard to clone oneself. There's only so much one person um, can do in terms of multiple areas. So I think we really have to think about I think we had talked about this in, in writing the strategic plan that we have standing committees and everybody has to make a commitment to at least one committee. Well, the way I look at something like this is that this is an opportunity for us to vote with our feet. That is to say, we don't have to, we've already agreed in principle to have all of these things as part of our strategic action plan. So we've taken that vote that's over. And when I talk about voting with your feet, I mean saying, uh, okay, this is a chunk I'd really be interested in, in and would help if there were one or two other people who are really interested in that. And then we could form a trust subcommittee to, uh, to work on that. Well, I'm really interested in the number 14, uh, promoting awareness. I think that it's, you know, usually when you read about things about housing, whether it's on next door or elsewhere, it's primarily very negative or sometimes misinformed. Um, so, you know, if there's something, and I think this would take coordination with city staff and, uh, you know, to appoint developers too, if we agree on the proposals, but, uh, you know, being able to communicate with community members that may be opposed to something just because they heard somebody else say something, um, and being able to be the first ones or, you know, be part of the conversation when it's happening, I think is really important. And like bringing awareness to the town needs around housing, et cetera. Yeah, I agree, Francis. I, um, the Housing Coalition is already doing some of this, but not nearly enough. Yeah, when you mentioned that, it also, um, I wrote down the Housing Coalition and then the town also started, the council really wanted uh, some some platform way to engage the community. So they, they launched uh, Engage Amherst. It's a new website. Oh yeah. Uh, yeah, it's kind of a, has like a soft, has a soft launch, but um, yeah, there's, so, you know, I think there's probably some tools that the town could, you know, use with, you know, as, if this were to move forward, you know, we could use some of the town's resources uh, and other ideas. So I think that right. probably, yeah, folds in pretty nicely. Yeah, and maybe it's just, you know, better coordination between all these um, entities and like, I didn't know we had this website and it's pretty cool. So just being able to learn about things and so that we can then share them with other people or something. Um. Yeah, we, <coughs> sorry, the Housing Coalition has a Facebook site Nice. Um, in which John Page has taken responsibility for posting a variety of things, all related to advocating for affordable housing. And there are additional things that we can do, but John's really had a nice start on getting that going. Nice. Nice. And maybe it's just supporting people that are promoting <laughs> public awareness. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Cool. No, I do think that's interesting. Um, I do think that there is a missing piece though. I do think a lot of property owners aren't aware of things and they're caught off guard when there's a project or if there's different changes. And so, I don't, you know, I don't know how to, I don't, you know, I'm not, I don't know how to do necessarily better outreach, but if there were some more tools that we could, you know, use. And I think the counselors I've even talked about, you know, at their district meetings, if they could have some things that they could then use and, and, and display or, or share so you know if we did build 
uh, you know, some references or a library of things and we could have them have them share that and, you know, just it starts getting out to more people. Yeah, actually, Chapa has a good set of references on making the case for affordable housing, which I can make available to people. Or maybe at least to Francis. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, but anybody else could be interested as well. But yeah, that's one of the things that CHAPA has done as part of its larger uh, municipal engagement initiative. That's awesome. If we get funded for TA, I'm willing to be part of that subcommittee for looking at new resources to ensure we have stable funding. Great. Okay, well, I'll leave everybody to think further about that and maybe bring that back next meeting for a little bit of review. And um, what else we go further? Okay, so now the next agenda item was, oh, the comprehensive housing policy. At least Carol has taken a close look at that and she, drafted some comments about it, uh, most of which I probably agree with, although honestly, I've only scanned the policy, the draft policy, and really need to do more work myself to make comments on it. I don't know, has anybody else other than Carol had a chance to look at that? I read it. Um. And I agreed with most of Carol's comments as well. Um, there were some things in particular. I think the, that it had as a low priority finding new funding streams for. Yeah, that's um, a, a clear concern. Um, we had earlier submitted, and this is before the town decided to do this comprehensive housing policy, a plan for affordable housing, which included ideas about financing and some specific development goals. And uh, that looks like it's pretty well been ignored in the work that we now have on the new town comprehensive policy. So while it's very comprehensive, it doesn't seem to include affordable housing. The words may be there, but the, there's not much behind it. Yeah, staff is um, John, Dave, and Dave Zomack, the assistant town manager, and myself are, we presented once to the community resource committee and we're presenting again in uh, a few weeks to them with staff comments on the policy. And then the community resource committee just started taking up zoning. So they had wanted boards and committees to provide comments by April first and that may be pushed back. So I do think if not this meeting then the next meeting, I think it'd be good to have the trust, you know, um, either develop a, a memo or talking points if you think there are some to provide to the uh, community resource committee on the policy. So, I you know, at one point, I think they were trying to adopt it by, or, you know, or send it to the council with recommendations to adopt it by um, July 1 or in June or by June or something. So. Well, at this point, I would advocate for not adopting it. <laughs> Allegra, do you have further comments? I'm sorry, I cut you off. Oh, no, yeah. I mean, I took some notes, and if if you want, I can type them up kind of like Carol did and send them to you, if that if That, that would works. be great. But definitely. I, I, was and I can share them with the about... entire group, as I did with Carol's before the next meeting. And yeah. similarly, if other people have comments, uh, I'll put them together. Uh, One possibly. thing I did like was it did say, you know, ideas about different ways to incentivize, including affordable units, like waiving or reducing fees for, you know, permitting or work connections to make it more attractive for developers. Mm -hmm. So. Yeah, my, my one of my thoughts, though, I think I don't I think I don't know if other staff shared is it's a long policy and it almost reads like an action plan. And so I guess 
John, I know the, the trust policy got kind of long too. And so the question for me is, you know, what, you know, what do we see as a policy document? Is it, you know, is it a policy statement or is it a document? And then what becomes the adoptive policy? Because, you know, they basically have strategies and actions which are pretty detailed. And so I've never thought of a policy as getting down to that level of detail. Like even what Allegro, you just said. I mean, I think there's a lot of it. I think, I think the document has a great summary of the housing studies that have been done the last two years. And a lot of, you know, they, you know, they, they synthesize the master plan and they have a lot of action steps, but to me, it's like, is, is that whole thing the policy <laughs> or is the policy something a little simpler? And then all this are things to get to it just because, you know, if that's adopted, what, what does that mean? Like, you know, what, um, the affordable housing policy, the trust had reduced the actual policy down to four pages. Right. And I remember Alyssa Brewer said that was too long. It's right now the, <laughs> I think the document's like 13 or 14 pages. And so, Hey, John, what's up? Paige, you have, um, oh. well, I was just going to say, I rarely, I rarely weigh in, but since we, I helped John with the, the final version, I did compare the two. And what's funny, like John said, is the text is actually reflected quite a bit, but maybe because it's so long, it's diluted. So our policy is actually, is really reflected in there, but it doesn't come out substantively. So I, I don't know what the solution to that is, but when I compared them, our words were there, they just got lost a little bit. And I think they didn't include the specific numerical goals that, that we had, which are really the heart of the policy. I mean, if you make a vague promise to do something, that's nice. Uh, but for me, it, it doesn't really resonate. Okay, well, I would urge as many of you as possible to um, take another look at that and uh, uh, to send, I guess you can send comments to me or to Nate and we'll make sure that a week or so before our next meeting, we'll have consolidated those so we can look at them and then maybe have some proposal together for how to formally respond to the CRC yeah, I mean, like I said, yeah, I, I think it's a, you know, they have a lot of information in that document. I, I'm, but it's a pretty in depth policy. Yeah. Okay. So, Will, did I give you enough time to talk about what's going on with the state legislature? A lot and nothing, right? <laughs> yeah, seriously. Um, yeah, I mean, I think there's, yeah, quite the laundry list of, of things that are on the menu, but unclear exactly when that all it's all going to be going down. Um, did everybody get a chance to read out the links that John sent out uh, for uh, the Western uh, the Coalition on Homelessness and, and from Chapa? Well, it's it's a pretty long list of things. I, I, I hesitate to go through them all sort of one by one here. There was one thing though, one difference between them. Um, John, I just wanted to highlight this for you and I don't know if this is something we wanna discuss with the trust, um, but uh, Pam Schwartz's uh, mailer had had listed a local option transfer tax um, legislation, which was not listed in CHAPA's. And I don't know if that's like a, I, I don't know why CHAPA is not supporting that if, or maybe it's just they don't think it's something that they're interested in, but for those of you who don't know, the, the proposed legislation is for, um, for, I guess it's actually sponsored by Joe Comerford. Um, and what uh, they're proposing is uh, a bill in the state house that would allow uh, different town, allow towns on a town by town basis to pass their own, um, uh, their own local option transfer tax would basically allow for um, towns to Basically, put a tax on luxury sales of uh, of you know high 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 value properties and have the tax go directly towards funding uh, uh, housing trusts um, or other sort of whatever. But but it's specifically designated for housing trusts. So um, I know that's something that John, you and I had spoken about briefly before, and then that was something that you didn't think that was particularly salient. But I just wasn't sure what the if, if you were aware of what the background was between like why 
Pamela would be advocating that and Chapa wouldn't or, or whatever. But Well, I actually sent a note to Chapa asking why they weren't advocating for some of the things that were on Pam's list. We're talking about Pamela Schwartz's list. She's the executive director of the Pioneer Valley something to end homelessness. I right, think. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm losing the full name in any event. Uh, and I got a note back saying that uh, Chapa would be considering additional things to add to the list in the future. Okay. <laughs> Nothing more specific than that. Yeah. Well, I wouldn't be surprised if it wasn't just like they ran out of they ran out of space on the paper or something like that. <laughs> well, it could be they said, okay, we're going to put down whatever it is, six or seven things that are the highest on our priority list. And that's what we're going to go to work on. And while there may be other things that are equally worthwhile or almost as worthwhile, we're not putting them on our list for now as a way of kind of conserving or recognizing the limitations of their resources. You know, just as we have to decide what we're actually going to work on. We right. can't do all the things that are on our lists. Uh, so they're in the same position as obviously as, as any other organization. So I think that may be the best explanation, but certainly from our point of view, uh, if we're looking for additional revenue sources, uh, we'd like to see that passed. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, and we can continue to thank Jo for her support of it and, uh, ask Lindy, uh, Mindy to put that on her, the list of things that she's also advocating. So I think that's a good thing to flag. Will, are there other things that you wanted to flag for us? Because I, I agree, there's no point in going through over the entire list. Yeah, um, well, I, I guess just one one point of order is uh, I think two months ago, uh, two meetings ago, I had mentioned that the, uh, um, the eviction ceiling uh, proposal had actually passed, but it hadn't. Um, and that is actually on the list of things that um, are, I think both Chapa and Pamela's, I was called Pam's group, um, had listed for, for proposing yeah. eviction record ceiling be moving forward. Um, I, I think it half passed. Is that, that right? Is, yes, I think there are some provisions that made it through and others that didn't. For example, I think if there's a child in a household that's evicted, the eviction ceiling is good for children, if I recall correctly, but I, honestly, I'm not sure. I just my recollection is that there were elements that passed and elements that were uh, taken out of the bill before the legislature passed it. And we need to look back at the detail. But I think that's why it's still on the list because uh, not all of the provisions that people were looking for were included in the bill that the legislature did pass. Well, um, well, so there's that, which I think actually would be huge and awesome. Um, there's also the, uh, you know, a tenant right to counsel is on there as well, which would be pretty cool. Um, I mean, I know that, you know, as we're talking about earlier, evictions in Amherst aren't exactly common, but, um, but still it's sort of just like standing for, you know, equal you know, opportunity to, to affordable housing and, to, you know, balancing the playing field between tenants and landlords. That's a pretty huge, um, pretty huge piece of legislation. Um, but then more specifically, I mean, as far as just like the budgetary concerns, um, I mean, well, you know, yeah, I, I don't, there's, there's just a lot of specific, <laughs> ones, but I would say like, as far as like what the trusts can do moving forward, I mean, I would say that like, you know, the, the, the action that you propose that we, you know, you know, endorse both Pam's list and Chava's list of priorities. And we, you know, we could um, either send a letter to, I mean, I know it's kind of with, with, both Mindy and Joe, I'm sure they support it anyway, but you know, we can, I don't know if sending them a letter would be fruitful or if, you know, writing to the governor. Um, but beyond that, um, yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure that there's much more appropriate that we could do at this time. A couple of comments. It doesn't hurt for us to send uh, Joe and Mindy letters uh, because it may push something that they may be in favor of anyway just a little bit higher on their priority list, something to be aware of. It's not as good as we as actually we had letters with cases of people who were harmed by the current status. But nonetheless, I think it helps. The other thing I was gonna say is I think two years ago now when eviction seal, sealing and uh, 
right to, of tenants to be represented came up, we not only endorsed it, but we asked Amherst Town Council to endorse it. And they endorsed both of those uh, bills, which I think helps a little bit more. Again, it yeah. means that Joe and Mindy will pay a little bit more attention to it if the town council has always also recommended in addition to ourselves. So I think it's, it's useful for you to point out things like that and say, okay, you know, let's endorse them as a group and let's also ask town council to endorse some specific bills. Yeah, great. Well, I love that idea of, of you know, trying to lasso in town council. Um, So again, if people look over those lists and as Will has done, there are specific things that you identify that you think we should push, um, bring them back to our next meeting. I mean, the immediate focus of the legislature is gonna be on the budget. And there have been various concerns raised by both Chapa and Pamela Schwartz about shortcomings in the budget. Uh, the governor has apparently replaced past state funds with expected or anticipated federal revenues, which is not the best idea in the long term. Uh, so uh, again, those are things to be looking for. It, they, they are the things that the legislature will take up next. They do the budget before they do generally uh, most of those other bills. So making some choices will be good for us. Uh, going forward. Any other comments? Nope. Okay, the next item and pretty much the last item on the agenda is uh, uh, asking uh, the Housing Trust to co-sponsor uh, potentially three evenings that the Housing Coalition is organizing. I also I already mentioned the first one on March 30th, there will be the event on creating a path to home ownership in Amherst for low income households. I can answer some more questions about the planning that's gone on for that if people have them. Uh, the second one is less far along, but it would probably be on March 20th and it might have the title racial equity and housing. And uh, I, that's gotten started with the reparations for Amherst group, although there are other people who are, uh, I'm expecting would participate. But at this point, they're the core group that I think would be presenting at that meeting. Uh, I've also asked uh, Whitney Demetrius, who we've been working with through CHAPA as part of the Housing Coalition to participate in that. Whitney has recently become uh, CHAPA's go-to person on fair housing. She's the director of fair housing now. Yeah, yeah director of fair housing, right. Go-to person isn't quite precise. You're <laughs> right, Francis. And before that, she worked for the Boston, I think it's Fair Housing Committee or Fair Housing Commission. So uh, Whitney will be available to talk about those issues and particularly to talk about CHAPA's legislative agenda on fair housing, which I think is great. Um, and I'm not quite sure what else that evening will uh, focus on, um, but I do ex expect to be doing further planning with Michelle Miller and others who are part of reparations for Amherst. And then the third one, which would be in May, probably May 25th, would be climate change, sustainability, and housing. And uh, through Evan Ross, uh, I am making contact with two people who are part of town council's ECAC, which is, uh, which is ECAC. Uh, I'm not coming up with those initials stand for, but it's the group that was started uh, by Darcy, uh, Darcy Dumont, who is a town counselor 
and is focusing on exactly those issues. And they're becoming, they're coming out with a report making recommendations to the town on climate change and sustainability, including on housing, probably in April, uh, although I'm not absolutely sure of that date and they may not be either, but that's my expectation. So that would be on May 25th. Uh, and these are kind of in lieu of our housing, uh, having or not having a housing forum this year. And there may be other kinds of events like this that we can ask the Housing Coalition to work on that we can also become co-sponsors. I also have agreement from the League of Women Voters at, of Amherst to be a co-sponsor of at least the first event. And I anticipate the others as well. So I move at the Housing Trust uh, agree to become co-sponsors of these three events. Uh, with the Housing Coalition and the League of Women Voters of Amherst. Is there a second? Second. And is there discussion? I have Questions, a question. comments? Sure, Erica. Um, what does it mean to uh, collaborate? I mean, what is our commitment? Do you expect people to be there at these events, at least have some representation? Do you want, do you need for us to speak? Um, so before agreeing, because I think it's a good idea, I just wanted to know what our role and responsibility is. Um, I think mostly it will means that our name is on the advertising for the event. Um, as I drafted it, and John Page is working on this, at the top it will say, uh, please come to an interactive forum sponsored by the Housing Coalition the Housing Trust and the League of Women Voters at Amherst. And then it will give the title and it will mention the three key organizations that are participating and then a little bit more information like the date and time. And that'll be it. Um, beyond that, it would be great if people can at least participate as listeners. Um, it's called an interactive forum because the idea is that we're gonna set time aside on and off during the meeting for people to uh, provide their own opinions and their own ideas, their own recommendations for what we should do on these issues. Um, again, I'm not asking anybody here to do anything specific, but certainly if anybody wants to become more involved uh, you know, just let me know. And th there are other events I'd like to do. Um, Sid and I talked about an event in which we would highlight uh, people who are in need of affordable housing in town. And uh, again, that kind of consistent with what Francis was asking for, how do we do things that create more interest and understanding? Um, about affordable housing. So we'll see if other people have ideas, then uh, we can put those together. Um, as I said, from my point of view, it's kind of in lieu of having a, a housing forum, although maybe it's a good strategy for us to be doing to some extent off into the future. Other comments or questions? When Are we ready when, to come? Sorry. Is that first one scheduled for, John? It's the end of the month, right? It's yeah, March 30th. And actually, I was wondering whether the town would be a sponsor. And also, we could use the town's webinar services, or maybe that means your services, Nate, to uh, uh, manage the event and to record it. And I would ask Amherst Media to make do the recording and, and to make it available on their website. Yeah, I can ask. And then I was thinking at least we can at least post it on the town's calendar even now, right? We could put it on the community calendar and then uh, we can do that the boards and the committee calendar. That way there's a notice that gets pushed out to people who register to receive that. Um, yep. John will have completed the flyer that we'll be sending out um, 
I'm not trying to gather as many co-sponsors as I've had in the past. We've had 15 or 20 co-sponsors. I think we'll just send a note to those organizations asking them to alert their members and to invite them to uh, participate in the event. Yeah. Other questions or comments? Okay, then we need to vote on this. And as usual, it needs to be a roll call vote. Uh, Sid, I see you down in the lower corner. So I'll ask you first. Yes. Will? Yes. Francis? Oh, yes. Allegra? Yes. <laughs> Erica? Yes. And I'm a yes. Okay, I think that uh, the, the only other items on the agenda are, are there any public comments? Anybody on our other attendees who want to make a comment or anybody on the housing trust have an additional comment? Okay. Uh, I see Kathleen Anderson among our attendees. Kathleen, I want to talk to you about participating in these special events, uh, but I don't have to do that right now. Uh, okay, uh, let's see. Upcoming meetings, I mentioned the meeting on the 30th. Our next meeting will be on April 8th, so it's coming right up. And again, a highlight of that meeting will be looking at some of the zoning issues and also looking at a penultimate draft of the request for proposals. Anybody have anything else? Okay, then I will make a motion to adjourn. Is it seconded? I think that's a second from Erica. Second. Uh, put your thumb up if you're in favor of being <laughs> able to sign off. Okay, thanks everybody. I appreciate everybody's participation. Thank um, you, John. This has been a very productive meeting. Thanks.